sure that the evil ones are destroyed. And as you know so well, schools and universities are being closed on a haphazard, often permanent basis in the West Bank and Gaza, another powerful instrument to make life unbearable for Palestinians. Torture goes far beyond simply everyday humiliation, though. Even beyond the cutting off of water, the polluting of scarce water supplies, the cutting of telephones, the cutting of medical services, the burning of books, Israel Shahak cites widespread, arbitrary arrest and imprisonment without due process, humiliation of young and old, women and children, and the ugly consequences of the government sanctioning of beatings, of beatings of innocent people, people on the street as well as those incarcerated in prison. Listen as I quote again Israel Shahak. Israel once showed respect for Palestinian women. They were sacred but no longer. Now these are Israel Shahak's words, not mine. Now as a matter of routine, a Palestinian woman may expect to be taken into custody without warning and forced to strip to her under, underpants. Then each woman, stripped nearly naked, is taken by a group of Israeli soldiers into a room the door is locked, and the woman is held there for an hour or so. And Shahak adds somberly, you can use your own imagination about what happens after the door is locked. And as an American, I hang my head in shame to have to recount those dreadful facts to you. Brutality touches men and women, young and old. Listen again to Israel Shahak. In the Israeli army, sadistic impulses of both young and older men are given totally free reign. They may be pursued with almost total impunity, sadistic measures. He, he gives us an example that four soldiers had beaten an Arab to death. They were subsequently exonerated and sent back to their unit. But now I must tell you of a dreadful example of brutality that appeared in the translation of the Hebrew press by Israel Shahak in the most recent issue, that of June of 1989. The account appeared in the widely respected Hebrew newspaper Haaretz as of May the 4th, 1989. I will, for the sake of time, summarize what happened. Acting on higher authority, a group of about 30 Israeli soldiers went into a village, rounded up 12 men. There was no accusation of any wrongdoing. They simply rounded them up. The men came peaceably and sat quietly until all 12 were found. Then the 12 Palestinians were taken to a nearby orchard. In groups of three, they separated. By then, they had had their arms shackled behind them. There was no way that any of them could use their arms. Three Palestinians were taken to one part of the orchard with a group of Israeli soldiers and three other groups of Palestinians to other points. When they reached their destinations within the orchard, they forced them to lie on the ground. They put shackles now on their legs. Then they took clubs. This was on higher authority. They didn't think the scheme up. It was in the chain of military command, they took clubs and beat on these poor 12 Palestinians until both arms were broken and both legs were broken, with one exception. In each group of three Palestinians, 
the order was given to break just the arms of one person. So in time, when he could recover his senses from the terrible pain that had been inflicted, he would be able to get himself up on his feet and go to the village and summon help. This dreadful assignment was so terrible, according to the article, that a number of the Israeli soldiers refused to take part. So they stayed in the bus that had brought the group to the orchard. The man operating the buff bus revved up the engines to make them noisy. Flannel was stuffed in the mouths of each of the 12 Palestinians before the beating began. And the news story in this Hebrew language respected daily in Jerusalem stated that most of the, most of the clubs were broken in the process of inflicting this dreadful injury to these innocent people. And don't think this was just an isolated incident, says the story, because just two days earlier, the same unit on the same orders inflicted the same sort of damage in a neighboring village. Let me read from Haaretz's article. Haaretz's article says, this story is a grim one. In the new Israel, any atrocity is possible. Those are not my words. Those are the words of the reporter that dug up the story. And then the article said, it should be noted that since the incident, some of the officers involved have been promoted in rank. No one has been brought to trial. As an American, I hang my head in shame that this happened with U.S. aid, with U.S. complicity, because these dreadful policies could never have been carried out without the acquiescence of the U.S. government. But let me ask larger questions. What happens to a government in which such atrocities have become commonplace? Israel will never be the same. The Israel of Ben-Gurion, the Israel of Nahum Goldman, the Israel of those people who dreamed of a Jewish homeland of consideration for all humanity, that Israel is already destroyed. Destroyed is this vision of a Jewish state devoted to respect for all human beings. What happens to the soldiers who sat on the bus while this dreadful punishment was being carried out? What happens to the minds and the attitude and the character of the soldiers that actually went into the orchard to carry out the beatings? What happens to the officers on high who designed this form of torture intended to keep the Palestinian people in line in their place? And what happens to the Palestinians those who were tortured will never forget that experience, nor will their relatives, nor will their neighbors. As long as they live, this dreadful experience will burn in their existence. But beyond the torture is another ominous face to the new Israel. Israel Shahak spoke of it with great eloquence and feeling during that luncheon meeting to which I referred. Israel Shahak's clarion call today and his warning is against something that is entirely new, something that Adolf Hitler had no way to inflict upon the Jews in Europe. It's slavery with a high-tech twist. Palestinians are now computerized. Each has an ID card that in the hands of Israeli authorities will call up all vital information about him, any charges that might have been made, whether founded or otherwise. The big brother 
of George Orwell's 1984 has found ultimate expression in Israel 1989.